it's on, it's going. So, welcome to the Auckland Antarctic Science Meetup. My name's Stuart Grayson. Uh, together with Nicholas O'Flaherty, I organize the meetup. And uh, normally we meet up uh, in a room at the university. But uh, this evening we've had to move online. Uh, we are hoping, hoping to get the face-to-face uh, -face meetings back uh, in August. So the, the Antarctic uh, Science Meetup was formed with the idea of bringing together uh, scientists and interested people um, to discuss science of Antarctica and some of the implications of that for, for example, for climate change. And uh, we've had over the last two and a half years um, about 30 different events. Tonight, we're really pleased to have one of the members of the meetup give us a, a talk um, about his experiences in going to Antarctica finally uh, and his experiences on a cruise with Dr. Carl from Australia. Um, Robin, who's giving the talk, will introduce and explain the background uh, to his experience. And uh, we're very much looking forward to uh, hearing from both of them. Just before we get started, uh, the event will last probably about an hour in terms of the, the talks. Um, we would like to do the questions at the end and the uh, opportunity is there to make use of the uh, chat facility on YouTube to write your questions in. I will collect those up and then at the end when uh, Robin and Dr. Carl are finished, I will uh, pose those questions for you. We're very grateful to be able to use uh, this infrastructure from the New Zealand Antarctic Society. Um, they have um, made this available for us and uh, we would encourage you to uh, look for the website for the Antarctic Society uh, if you're interested in staying connected with the Antarctic community in New Zealand. And one of the benefits is a magazine, magazine like this, um, which has, in addition to a, a, a large number of interesting articles, uh, a very new map of Antarctica published at the end of last year. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Robin, who will introduce himself and Dr. Carl. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, just to get my screen sorted out here. Um, and uh, welcome to all everyone watching, and uh, thank you to the Auckland um, Antarctic Science Meetup and the, for the opportunity to do this, and to uh, the New Zealand and, um, Society for sharing their platform <coughs> to enable it. Um, I'm just sharing the screen. And hopefully it should come through. So I, I was uh, lucky enough to join uh, Dr. Carl on a cruise to the Antarctic in um, late November last year. Um, and I've actually done some blog posts about it um, and I'll share that link because what you're gonna see is a very compressed version of a fantastic trip. And uh, to fit that experience into um, 20 odd minutes has, has been quite a challenge. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Carl for contributing to this uh, presentation. He was, um, he's in Australia, he's a very, uh, excuse me, it's jumping ahead on me. He's um, very busy at the moment editing two books and a, and a TV series script. So uh, we really thank him for us making the time to do this. And briefly, I'm gonna cover um, why I went to Antarctica, um, why I went with Carl, um, the experiences and activity we had there, um, some of the science and the history that we covered, and some of the science that um, happened post, um, post the experience um, in terms of uh, citizen science opportunities that were raised. Um, we also should point out this trip was pre-COVID, so there's no um, 
no social distancing. And I'm just wondering why my screen won't share. Ah, my presentation is locked up. I might try that again. Excuse me. Right, um, so to point out, I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm a retail and industrial des uh, designer by trade, and I um, work on CAD and related IT thing. I'm interested in science, and I joined the uh, science meetup um, to learn basically more for this trip. Um, Carl is a scientist, uh, as amongst of many other talents, um, but he also broadcasts weekly on uh, ABC and BBC. He's currently the um, Julius Summer Miller Fellow at Sydney University, and um, has written 45 books so far. And just before our trip, he was awarded the uh, UNESCO Kalinga Prize uh, for the popularization of science. Um, so for me, why Antarctica? Um, it comes down to, I've known about Antarctica all my life. Of course, I'm a Kiwi, so Ed Hillary and his exploits down there. We studied it at school, of course. Um, as a teenager, I had, uh, my neighbors were on the, um, Erebus, my name is grandmother, was on the Erebus um, flight so and uh, passed away on that. So I sort of took, had more than in anyone's interest in that. Um, but there was two books that sort of stuck in my mind, and one was from the 70s. My father bought it, um, and it detailed sort of the history and science exploration of uh, Antarctica. And... Um, the other one was by David Barker, um, and it, he was an artist, a New Zealand or UK born, but New Zealand artist who joined a yacht um, trip to the Antarctic Peninsula in the 90s and presented, uh, created this log book, which is full of lovely um, acrylic and watercolour and pencil sketches um, as a photograph, as a, an artistic essay of, of the journey. Um, Early in the 80s, I also saw this um, film, which was made, a Japanese made film, and it was based on an ill-fated um, 1958 Japanese science uh, expedition. Um, and the soundtrack uh, has been with me since I saw it, and it was by Vance Jealous, and it's a fantastic piece of music that captures amazingly the sounds and, and soundscapes that we kind of heard in Antarctica, even though Vance Jealous had never visited it. Um, Carl and I, I know Carl from podcast because he's on the radio in Australia, he's on the BBC, but we don't get those here. So his shows are um, converted podcasts and I've been listening to them for a long time. And um, I'm just going to change one setting here. Sorry. Um, so stop it advancing. Um, but he also does two other um, podcasts. He did Sleep Geeks, which is, was a podcast version of a live show, and uh, his Shirt Lies of Science, which is more detailed um, presentations or interviews with, with scientists. I saw Carl speak in um, Australia for the first time live, and that was at a, a meeting of skeptics called The Amazing Meeting. Um, it was held in a Masonic um, lodge, so a little bit um, of a strange venue. And then I got this uh, Antarctic cruise invitation from World Expeditions, who I'd travelled with previously on a cycle tour. And uh, when I saw Antarctica plus Sile, uh, plus Carl, I had to go. Um, just after booking the trip, I actually went to another Skeptics Conference in Sydney um, because there was a number of podcasters I listened to, and, and I got to meet Carl in person for the first time. Um, I bought one of his books and uh, lined up in the queue to get it signed. And... Um, I think maybe surprised him a little bit when I asked him to sign it and, and then said I would see him in Antarctica um, the next year. To get to Antarctica, I flew to Buenos Aires and then flew down to Ushuaia. And of course, the, the trip covered part of the Antarctic Peninsula, but a, a small part of it. Um, and arriving in Ushuaia, where we departed from, it was strangely familiar. And the, the, the geography and the vibe of the place reminded me of Queenstown. Um, quite an, an amazing way. It's a fast-growing uh, tourist town, and uh, we joined the ship there. Um, the MV Ortelius is a, uh, was built in Poland for uh, the Russian Academy of Science. Uh, it was purchased in 2011 by Oceanwide Expeditions, 
um, and reflag then. It's about 91 metres long, so it's not the biggest ship in Antarctica, and, and that's a good thing. Um, it does about 12 knots top, uh, top speed, 10 or 11 cruising, and it's ice strengthened, so it could actually um, go through broken ice. Um, it's not an ice breaker, but it is ice strengthened. After a safety briefing, we were, were departed um, port and you sail down um, the Beagle Channel and into Drake Passage to head across um, to Antarctica. We were really fortunate with weather on the first day. The day before had been rather blustery and cold, um, but uh, we had fine calm weather for the Beagle Channel and then the anticipation of whatever we were going to meet in Drake Passage, which is renowned for its uh, weather, but we were very lucky there too. It was basically moderate to light seas all the way um, and sunny and fine. There was a huge opportunity to um, bird watching and uh, nature watching on the way. We saw um, whales along the trip, to, uh, along the journey too, and had lectures. And then we sailed into the Antarctic Convergence and it was um, a really interesting experience because we had a lecture on Antarctic, the Antarctic climate system which I didn't know a huge amount about other than what I'd learned at the, the meetup. Um, but then within hours, you're actually sailing into it and the weather you know, changed completely and the temperature dropped 10 degrees um, in an instant. Um, the birds didn't mind though. To fill in the days on this um, straight, uh, Drake um, passage, there was um, lectures and activities and briefing, uh, activity briefings. So um, Carl gave, over the 12 days, we had 26 um, lectures from Carl or the crew. Um, we had IATO um, travel briefings, which is um, Antarctic Treaty Guidelines uh, and a bio check to check that you're not bringing any um, pests or um, vermin into Antarctica. Um, and then general information on um, principles around wildlife watching. Um, Oceanwide, who ran the trip on behalf of World Expeditions, were really sort of um, proactive and very sort of uh, pro the Antarctic, um, preserving the Antarctic and keeping it pristine, pristine for others. Most of the lectures were actually given in the bar um, and lounge area just because it was a more comfortable environment than the lecture theatre, which was down in the, the bow of the ship. And then um, up, after crossing the Drake Passage, we uh, overnight we actually got to the uh, peninsula. So the first, uh, just to show where we went, we had um, eight landings in total. Three of them were two bases. Um, every day there was simultaneous Zodiac crews uh, mountaineering, kayaking, photo workshops going on. Um, and the, acti the activities are a real emphasis of this trip in that it's not a cruise where you see Antarctica through a plate glass window. It's a um, an ex place where you experience Antarctica by getting off the ship. So most of the day, you're actually not on the ship at all. Um, generally, two stops a day. So they would reposition while we were having lunch. They would be uh, repositioning the ship to, for the next activity. Um, you can sort of see an example of a day plan, pretty full on from sort of 7.30 in the morning till the formal activities around 8 o'clock at night and to, uh, after dinner. Um, and then after that, there was quite often a lecture in the evening. And these plans were um, somewhat pre-arranged, but they were flexed continuously um, based on the weather and um, experiences and timing of the day. Um, and we'll get to that a little bit later. So our first real um, stop was um, Orne Harbour, and for me that was a kayaking activity. You get allocated a um, activity per day. So the first penguin colony I saw in Antarctica was from a kayak. Um, incredibly clear and, and calm water. Uh, we were very lucky with weather on this trip. And um, you'd sort of look down out of the kayak and think, oh, I could get out here and, and find that that water was probably two metres deep or something. Um, my first seals sighting, we saw crab eater, wood deal, seals and um, sea lions was from the kayak again. Um, and then we transitioned at lunchtime to a, a landing. And just to give an idea on the, the landing process, at Zodiacs, they had about 10 Zodiacs on the boat um, for 100 odd people. Um, they transfer uh, the drums on the Zodiac there are survival kits in case we got separated from the boat or the boat couldn't get back to us. Um, this shows a sort of a typical landing scenario. So we had um, snowshoes provided and we needed them for most landings when there was still a lot of snow because it was early in the experience. 
um, the inevitable penguin photo that has to be with ev with every Antarctic um, experience. Um, we saw a Delhi Gen 2 and Chinstrap penguins, um, but a lot of it was just standing back and experiencing the place. Um, it was just a staggering place and to actually be there uh, was a real privilege. Um, our first evening, again a beautiful evening, this photo was taken at about 11pm so it never really got totally dark. Um, and on, we had an on-board expedition photographer who was part of the expedition um, guides. He gave photo lessons from every device, from whether you had a phone or a full-blown SLR. Um, I took 4,000 odd photos and 3,000 of them were okay. Um, so this is a very small subset. Um, Werner's photos contributed to a, a voyage log, which Oceanwide provided, which was written by the staff for the journey. Um, it's 29 odd pages, six and a half thousand words. And he also produced a, a custom video of the trip, which was made for us. It wasn't just a can sort of special that they slot a few bits into. It was actually completely our trip and our experience. Um, we landed at Naco Harbour in Danko Island. And again, for me, this was a Zodiac landing. Sorry, uh, an example of uh, pre-COVID social distancing. So Oceanwide set out the uh, the cross and the photo there, and is um, and the photo there is, is basically the closest we were allowed to go to the um, penguin colony, following the, the travel guidelines. And when when the penguins um, where we needed to cross a penguin highway, they would have a guide stationed. Um, to control traffic where we were giving way to penguins. Um, so they were really good at sort of handling uh, the management of that kind of thing. This was another um, example of sort of experience following uh, learning. So learning about the relationship between skuas and penguins. Um, but then I was standing on the hill and heard the racket coming from behind me and spun around to see the skua buzzing the colony that was uh, a fair way away. Um, Kerr Point, we, I experienced was my camping activity. So in that, in that you get to put ashore, the ship goes away completely. So you have, for uh, us, it was total isolation. Um, and just being there and in the silence and enjoying the, the sound was a fantastic experience. Um, you get to dig a hole and you get given the bivy bag to spend uh, the evening in. Um, and with views like that in the background, it was just fantastic. Uh, again, an example of the travel operator. So there's no, nothing left behind. We were actually the second night at this camp. And when we arrived, there was little evidence that anyone had been there before. Um, and yet it had been a calm day with no snow. So, you know, footprints are filled in and all that sort of thing is, is handled really well. The toilet provided um, was, was recommended you didn't use it. And fortunately, I didn't have to. Um, and that was mainly not wanting to get up in the cold in the middle of the night. I spent most of the night with this... Uh, bivy bag open because it was relatively warm um, and I'd rather look at the view like that than the inside of a, um, a bivy bag. Um, I also sort of fulfilled my part of my mission on this trip was to listen to the soundtrack of Antarctica that I've been listening to since the 80s um, in Antarctica and that was quite an amazing experience to transition from the real sounds of penguin squabbling and the waves uh, plopping on the shore and the uh, ice creaking and groaning on the glacier sort of around the corner from us. And then here, uh, the soundtrack experience, which was amazingly similar. Um, woke up in the middle of the night, this was 3 a.m. to find a penguins wandering through the camp, sort of inspecting our survival kits. Um, quite an interesting experience. And then the next day we cruised the New My Channel, which is um, was the route to our first base visit. Um, it's about 26 kilometres long and two and a half kilometres wide between two islands. And again, we were just rewarded with amazing weather. Um, but what I found really fascinating was just the scale of Antarctica and yet the high level of detail. Um, so you'd look at a scene like this and be a moment, uh, blown away, but then you just look at a piece of ice or an iceberg in the water and uh, the colours and the... Um, experience of being there was just amazing. Um, as we cruised along, we were being raced by penguins. So Ortelius can do about 10 or 11 knots, which is about 20 kilometers an hour. And the penguins were overtaking us. Um, 
was just amazing. And you can see mirror calm water. It was just fantastic. We arrived at Port Lockroy, which was our first um, based visit. Um, it can take about 50 people at a time. And that's one of the advantages of being on a smaller ship in that we had um, half the passengers were out doing kayaking and uh, Zodiac cruises and half visited the base and then swapped around. So we were able to sort of turn that visit around a lot faster than a larger ship um, would be able to. Um, Port Lockroy is the most visited place in, in Antarctica. And they get about 18,000 people a year, um, was the last figure I could find. And it's the southernmost public post office. Um, it's operated as a, a souvenir or gift shop and post office to help fund the restoration and preservation of the base. Um, and my postcard made it back to New Zealand, um, which was pretty good after a long trip. It was used in the 1950s for um, atmospheric research and a lot of the conservation is going towards maintaining um, that the base in that era. So, And it was also really cool to meet the staff and, and conservation staff um, who were there. They'd been there about a week and to show how lucky we were with weather, um, they'd taken nearly two weeks to get there. They'd been turned back by ice in the Nirmai Channel. They'd been, hit, at one stage, uh, the whole bay was iced up. They couldn't get in there. Um, and they'd spent the best part of a week digging the equipment and or the base out of um, snow and getting their solar power working. Um, they actually returned from Port Lockroy to the UK um, in March. So they went from Port Lockroy to UK lockdown. And I've been following their blog posts um, on the website ever since. And it's been amazing to see um, their experience um, going from an isolated part of the world to um, isolation. That's kind of strange. Um, I did a little bit of science uh, communication on my own in terms of um, I was talking to a supplier that I uh, for our software for work. Um, and he's based in Chicago in the US just before the trip. And his four-year-old son was interested in um, Antarctica. He actually sat and watched Dr. Carl's um, short video that was used to promote the trip about four or five times. And uh, so I bought a um, little penguin, which I doubly named, uh, dubbed Lockie. Uh, so Lockie, and made a little story um, about Lockie's return uh, from Antarctica. And, and so Lockie is now living in um, Chicago and his son was four, oh, sorry. Yeah. His son was four when um, this happened and his fifth birthday was in February and he demanded an Antarctic themed um, birthday party for his fifth birthday and they had to print out some of my photos. So maybe I've created, uh, seeded the um, interest in Antarctica in, in one person at least. Um, as you can see, we were allowed on the bridge of the ship, which was a real privilege at pretty much any time. They, they occasionally closed it off if something was happening like uh, anchoring or docking or something like that. Um, and Lockie was allowed there too. Um, we did have a sort of an interesting change of plan. We were supposed to go through the Lemire Channel um, but it was almost completely blocked by a large iceberg. So they actually sailed up to it and showed us why we couldn't go through, which I thought was really cool. And then frantically rearranged um, to visit another base. Um, so we actually got a, a base visit um, instead of what we were going to do on the other side of uh, Lemire. I had a pseudoscience moment um, in that I, um, just for a laugh, um, have been watching a few YouTubes on the flat earth. And then I was looking at this chart plotter on the bridge of our ship in Antarctica. And a lot of the flat earthers claim that no one can go to Antarctica, which is patently false, um, and that there's an ice wall protecting the edge. And I saw this big arrow um, with the label edge, which was kind of interesting. Um, but I asked the captain, and, and basically what it is, the arrow is actually pointing north. Um, and the edge is a uh, touch control, which moves the ship icon to the edge of the screen so you can see further ahead of it. So uh, the world is not flat and, and we didn't see the edge. Um, the base we visited as an alternative to the Lemire Channel was um, Gonzalez Vidala, and it's a Chilean base, um, military staffed, surrounded by penguins, and uh, you could smell them. Um, they were great and they led us right into the base. They were really nice guys. Um, they, they'd been there a couple of weeks um, and a really isolated place. And, and I believe our visit was um, aided by a box of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. Uh, so they were really appreciative to see those, I think. 
Um, as I said, it's surrounded by penguins, and uh, the outcome of, of that is it uh, smells rather strongly, um, but just an amazing place to, to visit. And they've got one um, special residence, which uh, our expedition guides hoped would be there and, and was. Um, it's a leucistic penguin, which um, are pretty rare. It's apparently in Gentoos is about one in every 20,000 is leucistic, and it means they don't make any pigment in their feathers. So they're not albino, but they have no pigment. Um, but apparently they're accepted by the other um, penguins. They breed normally, and they actually are um, slowly increasing in number because of the, the breeding. Um, that they're doing. Um, I found a paper uh, related to that um, after the journey. Our final um, base visit was uh, our Minty Brown station. Um, and we did a zodiac cruise there. We could see shags and things re uh, nesting on the cliffs, penguins nesting. Um, and the one thing I didn't get many uh, much sightings of, we saw lots of um, whales, uh, Antarctic uh, minke, humpback, fin, and killer whales, but I actually didn't get many good photos, which uh, upset um, one of the citizen science post-trip citizen science things. Uh, we went to Deception Island, and Whalers um, Bay was the landing there. And my uh, learning there was really that the size of krill. Uh, there was krill on the um, beach and at five centimeters long they were much bigger than I anticipated and um, lovely seal photo that I managed to get there and the um, last landing was Telefon Bay um, and that was more of an experience of the volcanic sort of ge uh, geography of Deception Island um, and I visited White Island but uh, this, this was uh, another experience again steam rising from the beach. Our Drake Passage return was uh, relatively uh, rough, moderate seas, but but not as bad as it could have been. Um, the biggest outcome of the uh, trip that I have uh, is the amount of knowledge that was on the vessel, both the crew and um, the passengers. Um, Carl did 11 lectures, which covered um, cosmology, Antarctic, um, scientific research, uh, physiology, neurology, um, an amazing sort of mix of experiences and the ocean white crew were amazing so we had uh zet the kayak guy had uh he was on the swedish national kayak team but he also had a master of sciences in biology um, martin the mountaineer had climbed mount vincent in antarctica um, twice um, most of the other guides had some sort of science qualification eduardo had uh, astronomy uh, pierre um, papa were uh, marine mammal researchers and Claudia was a um, has a master of science and uh, emergency medicine uh, in her repertoire. Um, the the least lectures that we did from we got from the expedition crew were uh, just amazing and uh, covered a huge amount, amount number of pro, um, topics um, and Antarctic history climate change, um, this, ask the astronomer in terms of cosmology, the Anthropocene, um, Antarctic explorer, exploration, and a comparison of Antarctic and, and Arctic geography. Um, two si citizen science um, projects were suggested um, in terms of um, penguin watch, which anyone can do. You don't have to have been to Antarctica um, to do it and um, Happy Whale, which you take some tourist photos and actually tracks whales. So you can actually, if you've got a decent photo of a whale, you can um, help locate it. They can locate it from the tail markings. And um, you actually get reports on, on further sightings of that whale later on. The outcome of one of the um, discussions on climate change uh, was actually came from one of the passengers. And Michael Rowan's a uh, professor of philosophy from Tasmania. and um, Claudia in her climate change lecture mentioned uh, climate change skeptics, and he actually suggested they should be called climate gullibilists, um, which I kind of thought was a nice take on it. Um, climate change skeptics have tried to sort of chain, uh, take over the word skeptic, um, whereas they're not truly uh, skeptics and they, their beliefs aren't entirely scientific. Um, in terms of climate change too, world expeditions um, offset the carbon content of the trip 
um, through UN accredited um, carbon offsets, um, which goes a little bit to easing the conscience. Um, we had log records of locations, um, temperatures, sea states done daily by the crew. And we had a um, species log was maintained of all the sightings um, that we saw. So you can see we saw a vast array of um, wildlife. Um, it was a really wonderful experience. And basically what I've got coming out of it is um, remembering Antarctica, uh, the place doesn't leave you. Um, I've been really fortunate with some travels and that I've seen um, this photo, I've seen the top of Mount Everest. Um, I went through Tibet on a cycle trip and I've seen the bottom of the Grand Canyon. So I've seen some, been to some remarkable sort of geographic features and some isolated places. But Antarctica was completely different. And part of it was uh, just the vast scale. Um, this was our climbers um, climbing. That's the same people. And what you sort of get out of it is you've, you've visited somewhere that's not only isolated, um, but remote, but also truly unique. And really what I um, was blown away with this, the vast scale of what we visited was a tiny, tiny part of, of Antarctica. Um, and really that humans have impacted that place, you know, since we've discovered it, um, the, both its past, present and future is being impacted by our actions. Um, and it's probably that that um, changed me through the trip. So the guy that got off the uh, boat um, in Ushuaia 12 days after getting on it was a different person. Um, and I think part of it was just a, a, a sense of privilege and responsibility. And in fact, in part, I'm probably still there. Um, that's my sort of outcome. I don't think you, if, once you've been to Antarctica, you can't describe it. Um, photos don't capture it and it never escapes you. I'm just going to, I'm just going to hand back to Stuart. Are you there, Stuart? Um, Hello. Just getting used to this portal. Ah, here it comes. Hello, Robin. Thank you very much indeed for that. That was great. It, uh, I'm hoping now that uh, Dr. Carl is online and able to start sharing his part of the, the talk and we'll get a different view on, uh, on the trips to Antarctica as well as benefiting from Dr. Carl's wide experience of science communication. I think, Carl, can you turn yourself on to broadcast on the participants? Um, just while we're doing that, what I'll do is um, I, I'll post the link to my blogs on the um, both the YouTube and the meetup after the after the meeting's finished. Great. So. Uh, commenting. Right. So I can see um, Dr. Let me just message. We're just waiting for Carl in Australia to um, yes, he, he. turn his. Here he's coming. It won't be long now. Here we no. go. Ahoy. Ahoy. Thank you. Welcome, Hello. Carl. 
Thank you. Hello, look, thank you for that. Um, I got switched off, but now I'm back on again. Um, okay. Let's start by screen sharing. Hi, I'm Carl, and I've had a little bit of an intro. Uh, I've only got 20 minutes or so left, so let's just roll straight into it. And what you should be looking at right now is okay, something saying it. Australian government. Can you see that? Here we go. Okay, Ahoy. here we go. Ahoy. Thank you. Welcome, Hello. Carl. Hello. Oops, Hello. 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 Um, I got switched off, but now I'm back on again. Um, now, I'm getting a feedback through the system, so hopefully you can switch that off from my end and I'll start going. So the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic, well, ant means opposite and arct mean, Arctic means north or in another dialect it means bear. And so the Arctic is a place where you've got not much ice and it's floating on not a lot of water. Excuse me, can you share your screen? I can't see your screen. Coming back again? Yes, I've shared the screen. I'll do it again. Here we go. And coming through again and doing it all again, That's uh, unlike the days of the toaster where everything would work anyway. And here we go, back in again. And so the, um, can you see that there on yeah, the screen? Okay, so the Arctic is a small amount of ice floating on a little bit of water. The Antarctic is the exact opposite, a huge amount of ice sitting on a lot of land. And the Antarctic is surrounded by a lot of water, and then there's not much land, and uh, the Arctic is the exact opposite. So in the Arctic, you have polar bears, and they're big creatures. The biggest creature that's natively there on land in the Antarctic is something about a tenth of a millimetre long called a tardigrade, and the tardigrades can survive being put on the outside of the International Space Station, in the, the outside, not the inside, at temperatures ranging from minus 100 to plus 200 and zero air pressure and the uh, harsh radiation of space. And when they come back to Earth, they just wake up again. Now, here you can see, looking at it from above the North Pole and the South Pole, and on my previous trip before going down with Robin, I flew down from Hobart um, down to Casey Station, and there you can see the rather brutal communist-style architecture of just red metal, and here's a bit of a movie that we made of it, and you can see people moving around. Over there, you can see on the building a Triple J flag over at the far left. Yes, I defaced official government property. Come and get me coppered. And then you can see the sun going down, and you can see the temperature at the bottom left, the wind at the bottom right, and then the time at the top right. How do you get down there? You get down there in an aeroplane, and it's a modified Airbus 320. What have they got down there? Penguins, and they're doing research. Um, there's a lot of wind down there. Here's somebody trudging through the snow, and they're drilling through the ice to learn about the past climates. Um, and here they are getting lots of more ice samples, and you, you can see they're getting more ice samples. The big wind is a big feature. Uh, there you can see this aeroplane flying out. That aeroplane is actually older than your grandparents. It was built before the Second World War, and they've repurposed these planes, and they've kept propellers on them, but they've taken out the petrol engines and put in jet engines. Um, and over here you can see, now if you listen carefully, you should be able to hear the ice crackling. So this is ice that is maybe 30,000 years old, and you can hear as it breaks in the background of the noise, you can hear a very sharp noise up and down. It's got a very sharp approach departure curve on the leading and trailing edges of the sound. Have a listen to the bubbles popping, these 40,000-year-old bubbles of air. Uh, okay. okay, there's a lot of noise in the background, but that's the bubbles. Uh, here's the first iceberg I saw down there, penguins with a bird, a skewer flying above them, thinking, I want some dinner time. Here I am in my wet weather gear. Now, for me, one of the, oh, actually, that's the going over water gear um, and the inflatable suit that will keep me alive for a little while. Now, the big surprise for me was that around the Antarctic, you've got a, a set of cyclones going around. You've got a clockwise circulation of cyclones, and the cyclones themselves are rotating clockwise, hitting countries like Australia and New Zealand. And here you can see on this null Earth map, you can see that little green circle, that's Casey Base Station, and you can see some of the half dozen or so cyclones that are always rotating clockwise and orbiting clockwise around the Antarctic. And so when they come close onto the land, you end up getting cold fronts coming across Australia and New Zealand, but when they come close 
onto Antarctica, you get a normal wind. And if the wind is under 74 kilometres an hour, no worries at all. Up to about 110 kilometres an hour, well, you should sort of consider phoning ahead or carrying a radio. It's dangerous when it goes up to 185 kilometres an hour. And I've been in that and you have to travel in pairs and use what they call blizz lines. And then when it gets above 185 kilometres an hour, you're not allowed to travel at all. So on one day when the wind was gusting up to 71 knots, um, we went outside. Now, here's the rule of thumb. You can survive a wind based on the number of kilograms you weigh. If you weigh 72 kilograms, you can survive a 71 knot wind. So the limit is one knot per kilogram and uh, 71 uh, knots is roughly 130 kilometres an hour. Now, that was the first surprise that there's always cyclones going around the Antarctic. For me, the second big surprise was that the sky is blue. Have a look at that where the arrow is pointing. Look at that. It's blue sky, right? There's a blizzard happening and there's blue sky. So the wind, the snow is being blown across the countryside towards you. And if you look straight up, you'll see blue sky. Here out the back, you can see the big gas bottles that we would use for cooking gas. But once again, blue sky. And there's a gas bottles gradually getting buried in the snow. So obviously, once it got up to 200 kilometres an hour, the thing to do was to go outside. And here's outside. And out I went. Uh, here I am coming outside. Now, I was wearing special clothing, which had my name on it so that they could then identify the body if I happened to get lost in the storm. There's my name. And over here on the corner of the building, there's somebody standing and uh, surviving winds of 200 kilometres an hour. That's 200 K. Now, I'm a bit of a wuss, so I went out wearing gloves. Here's my gloves. But these people are tough. See how tough they are? They're going out wearing ordinary clothes and wait for it. Not only do they wear thongs, they're also showing a bit of nice tradies cleavage. That's how tough they are. So this is a proper stance for standing in the 200 kilometre per hour wind. You have your legs far apart and you're leaning into the wind and you have your legs far apart so if the wind blows, suddenly drops, you don't fall on your face. And here I am the next morning going to work at a temperature of minus five with a 50 kilometre an hour wind with my incredibly long and skinny legs, uh, wearing everything I need to set up my radio station, getting a little wave. And those boots I'm wearing are rated for minus 60 degrees C. Now, here I am in the little mini radio station that we set up and we did. Uh, the first ever talkback radio from Antarctica. We did seven radio shows, including Triple J and the BBC. The lady next to me, she's remarkable. We're going to introduce her. I'm standing at a window which is triple glazed. Um, and so the way that the signals went was there were about a dozen links. Oh, so we did... The, the, I've got a little box there that turns the audio signal into digital. And then it goes from Casey Base Station straight up to a communication satellite over the equator, then back down to Perth, then across to Hobart where the Antarctic Division is based, then to the ABC uh, Sydney, and then from there all the way by under, underwater optic fibre to the BBC in the UK, and then from the BBC it then went to Boston where the host would say, hi, Dr. Carl, and then it all go bouncing back and I'd say, hi, Dr. Rod. So that was the real first ever radio broadcast talkback radio from the ice and here we are all being happy and cheerful talking about it um and we were just having a good time now sharon she ha has her job well this is her office see that that's her office and her job is to drive that caterpillar around and you'll notice that behind the caterpillar there's a couple of sleds here there's only a couple of sleds i got to sit inside her office here i am sitting in her office and so typically she'd go from and deliver uh, cargo from the coast to something called Dome Sea. So underneath the ice, the uh, the land bulges upwards, and so they call that Dome A, Dome B, and rather unromantically Dome Sea. And her job was to supply that Dome Sea station where they did ice drilling with stuff all the way from DDU, which is De Montdeville, the French base on the coast. And that distance was about 1,100 kilometres. And they would do about 100 kilometres a day. And that was a 16-hour day. So if you're thinking about driving for 16 hours and all you cover is 100 kilometres, that's pretty darn hard driving. And you're thinking, well, what's the problem? You've got this huge big tractor here and it's got rubber tyres. You know, what's the big deal? Well, let me tell you what the big deal is. So a bit of background on Sharon.
Now, Sharon went through ordinary high, primary school, high school, and then did secretarial work, then became a DZO. And because you share, you New Zealanders, a cultural base with us, you know that a DZO is a diesel mechanic. And she worked in servicing diesel machines in coal mines in Queensland and in snow resorts in the USA and got a lot of skill. And she was so good that she went from being a DZO to being the Traverse team leader, which she held that position for 19 years. So basically that means is that she's a commander. If anything goes wrong, it's entirely her fault. Now, she was a boss and she was lent by the Australians to the French because she was so good. The problem was that she couldn't speak French and they couldn't speak English. And she knew that something was wrong by the way they start saying her name more quickly in successively higher pitched tones. Sharon, 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 Sharon. And she'd know that something was wrong and then they'd use sign language to fix the problem. And she had total responsibility for every person's life and for the cargo that she had to deliver over 12 days, over 1,200 kilometres. And notice that the word responsibility has the letter I in it in red. It normally always has the letter I in it, in, um, except on the Australian banknote. So you go look at the Australian banknote and you have a little hand lens and you look at that little bit at the tip of the arrow, you'll see the word responsibility is spelt without the letter I before the T-Y. They left it out. How many times did they leave it out? 46 million times. Does this borrow from the government at all? Nah, uh, just typical business as usual. So unlike... Um, the government refusing to take responsibility for their mistake. Sharon had total responsibility for 12 people and 600 tonnes of cargo. Here's 200 tonnes, and you can see that in the illustration, you got three little pumpkins, that's fuel, and then you got another challenge attractor. These, these are big guys. And then you got the cargo, and there's new living quarters, and then there were not just one of these tractor trains, but two and, in fact, three of them. And you'll notice that she had the total responsibility for keeping, whoops, hitting the button the wrong way, for keeping everybody <laughs> along these three tractor trains. And notice that there's this weird machine at the top left, and that is a special sort of snow carving machine. That machine is handmade. There's only a few dozen of them in the whole world, and they're for very hard work such as you find down in the Antarctic. Oops, hitting the wrong button again. And so um, the hard work is it's called a traverse special and it leads the convoy and it navigates and it clears the road and it's been specially made to deal with, and here's a word that I never knew before I went to Antarctica, satsdrugi. What the hell is satsdrugi? These are satsdrugi. Hard ripples in the ice put there by the ice moving and the wind and they're as solid as rock. And trying to drive across that is just hell on wheels. So the, you have the Traverse Special at the front, which Sharon would drive, and I'll go into that in a bit more. And then she's immediately followed by a tractor train, which has got two tractors um, with flexible couplings joining them to everything else. All the other connections are hard connections. And these are the rubber track tyres. And you're thinking, well, it's fairly easy, you know, like, I mean, you just sit there and you drive it, nice clear blue skies. The weather in the Antarctic can be incredibly extreme. So here you can see some sun dogs, um, and that's pretty bad. And Sharon, notice that the tip of her nose is red. Why is her nose red? Because the outside air temperature is minus 50 degrees centigrade. And the tractor looking like this where the temperature is only minus 10. Yeah, but what about when you put the tractor to bed and a blizzard blows all night and you wake up in the morning and you have to shift half a tonne of ice to get to your tractor. And then inside the tractor, you've got to remove a couple of hundred kilograms of ice. This is hard work, right? And that's even before you can get it going. And then you start driving and then the blizzard is shining. And those headlights on the fronts of the vehicles, they need a special generator. They're 25 kilowatts. They're, a couple of, they're about four or 5,000 watts each, not four or five watts or 40 or 50 or a couple of hundred. That's a, that needs a 25,000 watt generator just to drive them, which is a box a couple of square cubic metres in size. And what she had to do was drive 
the lead vehicle with the blade exactly the right height so that she could pick the tip of one of the ripples on the sastrugi and then drop it in the groove and then repeat that and do that for 16 hours a day, driving at a few kilometres per hour. And sometimes it was fine weather and sometimes it was so snowy she couldn't even see the tracks out the side. So she could look forward here. You can see she's looking forward and she can see the blade that she's trying to drive up and down gently. But on some occasions, she could not see the blade. And if she looked out the side window, she couldn't see the rubber tracks. And she could tell that she was going, that the engine was roaring because it was making noise. And she could see the tachometer going on the engine. And the only way that she knew that she was stalled was because the GPS registered that her velocity was zero. She couldn't even see the tracks. And so then she'd have to radio everybody and then they'd have to stop and then unhook and then reverse and then clean it up and it was a whole mess. So the, the weather down there can be extreme. This guy here, now, by the way, all the people down there are remarkable. Sharon was truly astonishing how she'd been the team leader for nearly two decades. And everybody down there has extra skills. You have to be. Um, this guy here uh, is in addition to being having been a diesel and also a driver for the tractors, is also a um, the world the Australian uh, Taekwondo kick no Muay Thai kickboxing champion of Australia, and here he is, and, uh, and he was telling me how on one occasion it took him about an hour to get from outside that window to inside. So. Um, here he is taking me on, on, on a bit of a tour in a wind. But getting back to that window, on one occasion he was out on the airstrip, which is 72 kilometres inland from the base, and he was trying to smooth off the airstrip. Which And each year, this year they have to move 300,000 tonnes of ice. Just think about that. A third of a million tonnes of ice between three people driving three blade machines. It's a lot of work they have to do. And suddenly a blizzard hit out of nowhere. They weren't expecting it. And so he made his way back to the airstrip base, which was only half a kilometre away, but he couldn't see a single thing. He was going totally by the GPS. And then when he got there, he said, look, I'm pretty sure I'm parked out the front. Can you guys see me? And they said, no. And they said, well, we've got the radar going. We can see you on the radar. And so they said, wait there. And then they had parked the big Challenger tractor theirs on the downwind side because as soon as the blizzard hit, they parked on a downwind side and then went into the Challenger tractor, then drove it around to try and find him. And they got a radar unit on the top of the Challenger and then found him and then parked just upwind and he could just barely see this huge bulk of a thing and then he jumped across and they took him back in and it took an hour. So the conditions are quite bad there. Here we are in about 100 kilometre per hour wind and I was wondering why the top of my skull was very cold and it was because the 100 kilometre per hour wind had blown my little hoodie off. And by the way, now here's something you're not allowed to tell anybody. This is a secret. See this sign here that says Ar Antarctic Circle? It's fake. Why is it fake? Well, the airstrip is quite a way inland from the base station and they fly in on this plane. And so um, you'd get the very high dignitary saying, oh, we've landed here in Antarctica. We're not far from the Antarctic Circle. Can we drive out there to the Antarctic Circle? And because they were the high dignitaries, everybody had to say, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full. And so they'd spend four hours driving them out there and they'd take a photograph of themselves next to the Antarctic Circle side, then come back again, and that was eight hours wasted. So what they did was that they put up this fake sign about a quarter of an hour away from the base. So they'd drive them out there and after a quarter of an hour, everybody's getting bored. They'd say, okay, here we are. And they'd say, this is the Antarctic Circle. They'd get a photograph and get back in and they'd save themselves seven hours of time. This is the plane that took us down there, and it's taken. They've taken out the um, pods that sit in the luggage compartment and replaced them with nine fuel pods, so we can fly all the way from Hobart for eight hours down to Antarctica, circle around, and then come back again because there's no facilities to refuel it. Or if they land, they keep the engines running because if they switch them off, they can't restart them again. And here's Dean, the guy who uh, got stuck out in the snow, um, sitting in front of his uh, machine. Um, there, there he is, sitting in front of his machine. These little machines here are called Hargs, uh, Hugwinder. Um, there's two of them. 
they're basically a four-seater vehicle and they've taken off the uh, wheels and simply put on tracks and they're, the tracks have driven from the front and the back wheels and they've got a fiberglass body so they'll float in water so the front one is always a, a driver uh with people and the back one is also driven you can see the tracks and that's just a cargo vehicle and you can see the radar unit on the top there and on one occasion um so here's dean again he told me this story about some people who got tra trapped traveling from one building to another you can see one building on the right and another building on the left, and that's after we had a big uh, blizzard come through. So we got stuck down in the Antarctic for an extra week, over and above what we should have been doing. Um, uh, see on the right-hand side, there's a fence. So a couple of guys were walking across uh, when the blizzard hit them, and they were halfway between the two buildings, and suddenly the visibility went from wall to wall to zero. And at the same time, they just got thrown to the ground. Well, they stood up again and then got thrown to the ground again and then suddenly realised they didn't know which way they'd been heading. So they started crawling with their hands, with their elbows linked. And after crawling for about 15 metres, the buildings are 10 metres apart, realised that they had were lost. They then chucked a U.E. trying to retrace their own tracks, couldn't find their own tracks. And then another gust of wind hit them, maybe 200 and something kilometres an hour, and they got separated. One of the guys... Now, this is just a normal afternoon walking from one building to the other. One of the guys started walking towards the centre of the vision, uh, past me and then down towards the centre, and then uh, trying to find the building, was crawling on his hands and knees. And after about 15, 20 metres, 30 metres of crawling, realised, I'm lost. I can't do a single thing. I'm just going to stop. And he went unconscious. The other guy, luckily, stumbled into the building, or, you know, on his hands and knees, and then they tied a rope, to that uh, set of stairs coming down, the rail, and then they started describing circles, two metres in diameter, three metres, four metres, and finally at 40 metres away, they stumbled across him, brought him back in, and nobody died. Happy ending. Right, and so therefore, they decided I would stay on the ice overnight, and we went out in the hard, and here we are going across on the 100 metres thick of ice. Um, when we got there, we realised we had a bit of a problem, which was that I'd forgotten to get the instructions on how to put up the tent. I thought you had the instructions. No, you had. No, nah, no, you had. I don't know. Anyway, we eventually got it up and finally got it up. And then they went and then they left me. And just to prove that we are really true, deep Australians, uh, the person who took off and then left me, he then did a couple of donuts, a couple of really <laughs> Here he is doing a few dodos, and then he takes off into the horizon, leaving me there alone. And then I was in the tent by myself, um, and it was freezing cold. And when I woke up in the morning, to my surprise, the water bottle was totally frozen. And when I met up with the other people, I said, my water bottle was frozen. They said, "Because well, the thing was that the air temperature outside was colder than inside of your freezer. And they said, didn't you put it inside your water bag? You know, inside a tea bag, no, trap for young players. Then uh, heading back when the – so, we were tra as I mentioned, we were trapped down there for a uh, an extra week because the blizzard came and wouldn't go away. And then we got onto this huge vehicle here and then drove back. So this vehicle's got only one job, which is to drive people to and from uh, the between the base station on the coast and the airstrip inland, climb up the stairs. And when we were at the base station, we then had this wonderful experience, which was – I got to use something that I'm sure that none of you have ever used, an electric incinerating toilet. Oh, my God, an electric incinerating toilet. I didn't know such a thing existed. And so they said, you've got to try the toilet. So I did. Um, and so I went up there and I opened it up and you can see that there's a stainless steel bowl in a sort of a broken clamshell and glowing gently as is the previous person's feces without any smell. So, you know, you've got to get rid of it somehow. So they just burned up with electricity. And they have the instructions on the inside. They say, caution, use the bowl liner for each and every use. So you've got this hard, thick, cardboardy paper that you defecate into. It. And then at the bottom it says, face the toilet to flush. Face the toilet to flush. Well, the only way you could face the toilet to flush, and by the way, by flush, they don't mean run water through it because we're in Antarctica. What they mean is that you um, get rid of what's there. That's what they mean by flush. Um, the only way you can face the toilet to flush is actually you get dressed and you stand up. And so I stood up and then it said, close the lid. And being a bit naughty, I wanted to see what happened when I pressed the button. So then 
I pressed, uh, I stood up and got, yeah, got dressed and then um, opened the lid. It said, shut the lid. I opened the lid and pressed the button. And firstly, I got this. And this is why they say close the, the lid because otherwise you get a burnt bum and it was very embarrassing going to the doctor with blisters on your bum and then it went away. So it, I've written about this in my next book, but I've, I've come to the end of my time. So I'm now going to come out of the presentation and go back to the bottom of the hour. And here we are coming out of screen sharing. And I'm how do I come out of screen sharing. Have I come out of screen sharing? Am I back to normal again? Yes. <laughs> yep. Great. Okay, and I've got the lights back on, so you've got my little light here. Okay, um, we've come to the uh, end of time. I had to finish a bit early there, but here we are. Thanks, Carl. I'm just waiting for um, Stuart's just going to rejoin us. Um, okay, and we're doing – now, how's our timing? Is, is the bottom of the hour a hard finish, or we've got a little bit of time for Q&A? No, we've got, we've got time. We've got time, I think. Okay, ready to rock. Uh, just – Ah, there's okay. an SV appearing. I guess, oh, can, I ask, can I ask you a question, Carl, with regards mm -hmm. to your your live broadcasts? Um, mm -hmm. You get a lot of calls on your on your show, your podcast as, as a live thing. Was, was there a lot of follow-up from that? Do you get a, much um, feedback from either the station or, or your listeners directly um, with regards to the live broadcast from Antarctica? Yes, even though the signal had to go all the way up to the satellite and then down, then down to Perth and across to Hobart and then up to the ABC, the time delay, the, the quality was perfect. Yeah. The audio, the, the ones and noughts were perfect. Mind you, um, we were on an official government band running from Hobart, from Perth to Hobart, because that was the Australian Antarctic Division, and you're not allowed to put voice packets on it. And so the IT people had to muck them up a bit because did you know that voice packets are slightly different from normal data packets? <laughs> no. So data packets have the address of where they're going and the address of where they've come through and the data and they've got a counter which says that I'm packet number 23 of 400. Division, and you're not allowed to put voice packets on it. And so the IT people had to muck them up a bit because you know the voice there. packets are slightly I've got, different I've got from feedback data happening. packets. Yeah, I think <laughs> so, so data packets have the address of where they're going. And that should be better. Hi. I'm just... Okay, right. Okay, so <laughs> so we've turned off. So, Robin, you've turned off the audio from Stuart. Uh, yeah, yeah. See that? Yeah, because yeah, I saw later. Like, okay, right, moving right along. And so the thing about data packets is that you've got to get 400 of them, say, and if you only get 399, your computer says, look, I'm only getting 399, give me another packet. Yeah. Voice packets don't care. The okay. delay is a worse problem than a slight glitch in audio. So right. voice packets are different and you're not allowed to put them onto a government network, which we did. Okay. Oh, <laughs> so the delay was only about maybe three quarters of a second. It was astonishing. Um, we, we managed to do it uh, all the way to the ABC in Australia and going back all the way to the BBC. Hope that answers your question. Next question or comment? Hang on, just waiting for Stuart here. Uh, I'll turn his audio on again. <laughs> or maybe he can put the questions in the chat bar at the left um, or something. In terms of leading the trip, um, how, you've, how many trips have you actually taken with other people, like like the trip we did to Antarctica? Five. Five? And which parts? Yeah. Of, had you been to the peninsula before? Um, three of the trips um, were to from Australia and New Zealand, and that's what you call the deep Antarctic experience, yeah. where you spend a fair amount of time travelling a week down and then a yeah. week there, and then a week coming back. And the advantage of the long time is you really get to appreciate how hard it was for those people back then without a big, fat diesel engine and a, a, a nice ice-hardened steel ship. Whereas the other one from the Ushuaia Antarctic Peninsula is a day and a half across, maybe a yeah. week and a bit down there, and a day and a half back. So it's quite a different experience with more animals. They're both wonderful. Right. Um, and um, for, for those watching, uh, are you planning any more? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd love to take go down there. Now, somebody asked a question there, which I just saw pop up, um, which was, do I always talk at that speed? Well, um, I 
I hope it wasn't so fast <laughs> but just sort of, uh, as to be not making sense. I was just try. I, I just sort of had run out of time because I thought we had a hard finish at the bottom of the hour. Next question or comment? No, is that it? Uh, hang on, got one here. That says. Uh, the question is from Erica. As my daughter was on the Aurora um, to Mawson and Davis, she was surprised to find so little science going on in Antarctica. Is this re reflective of a deficit uh, in um, Australian research funding? Um, the Australian government does not see science or technology as worthwhile investments in the future nor education. So in my case, I've had 28 years of education, including 16 years at university, all for free, whereas now we've gone to a situation where the universities have been so defunded that if you have a situation like happened at the beginning of the year where all the Australian students have paid their fees and the lecturers are there and the buildings are there, the lectures get cancelled because the overseas students can't turn up because of the quarantine and therefore they don't have enough money without the money from the overseas students to run the university. Right. And an example of the lack of respect, we've got a thing here called in Australia the Job Keeper Program. And on three occasions, the university said, oh, we'd like to apply for this job keeper program where you give us some money to help employ people. And on each of three occasions, the Australian government has subtly altered the rules that while um, coffee makers and tradies and school teachers and every other walk of life can get the funding to keep them in work, the universities have been specifically locked out. So the lack of science was just typical of our government. Yeah, like your government, you, you, New Zealand, you've launched 200 rockets into space. How many have we launched? Zero, right? Big enough <laughs> to New Zealand. I mean, 200 satellites, sorry. Right. <laughs> okay, um, next question. I'm just looking at one here uh, from Jared Huntley. It says, what? What is the, um, he loved your talk at the STEM 2020 uh, conference. Mm -hmm. What's your, uh, what's the role of Antarctica in, in inspiring the minds of young people? We it's actually part have of the package. Um, like Antarctic, uh, okay. In the same way that the tobacco companies deny that tobacco is harmful for your health, the fossil fuel companies with the help of Rupert Murdoch, have put forward a very successful campaign to deny the science of climate change. Bad things are happening in Antarctica. Now, here's the good news. We can fix it. All we need is different politicians. But the current politicians are not doing anything about it on a world scale. There's a website called drawdown.org, and that it works out a path, shows you a pathway, very well planned for not only stopping carbon emissions entirely, but drawing down the carbon dioxide from the 417 parts per million it currently is at last week down to 350. The role of Antarctica, it is terrible things are happening there with regard to glaciers. Look up Thwaites Glacier if you want to get really scared, T-H-W-A-I-T-E-S. And there's a few glaciers that if they pop, can do a very sudden, very large rise in ocean level. Read up about the Thwaites Glacier. There was an article about it in the Scientific American. The Antarctic is incredibly important for our future. We need to know what's going on down there, and we need to do something about it with regard to climate change. Bit of a right. cliche answer. Sorry. <laughs> Another question or comment? Um, on the, it's actually on, on the meetup, this one. I just saw it um, from Christian, and he says, does, does, do, you, uh, do the trips normally happen in November, December? I Yes, because you can't get down there at any other time. So you have 
um, the South Pole being, we turn the world upside down, you got the South Pole at the tip, and then you got ice to about 60 something degrees. And then you got nothing, mate. Yeah. It's only when you get to about 40, 45 degrees or so do you get a little bit of Australia, New Zealand, a little bit of South Africa, a little bit of uh, South America popping into it. And so with that ocean just there, you get the roaring 40s and they just build up and up. And then you got the furious 50s and the screaming 60s. And we got a bit of a hint of bad weather, but I've been in... Um, uh, weather so bad that when we're traveling from Australia, from New Zealand down, we yeah. actually lost our engine for about four minutes and we we're in danger of getting tipped over. Oh, and it was side. really scary. Yeah. Um, so you get these tremendous winds. So you can't get in. You can't fly in because the winds are too high and you can't get in because, sure, you can get to a ship and then you stop by the ice and the ice is 200 kilometres away from the base station. So you just can't get there. So oh, right. all the expeditions have their in and outs around the Antarctic summer. There was a case where somebody did fly into the South Pole in the middle of winter and that was for, for a medical reason and that was such a big operation to right. organise. And they had to use a special plane that was totally mechanical and that was so simple that it could be run even if everything froze up. I think that was my <laughs> big, big takeaway from one of the safety briefings was to be careful because you could end the trip for everyone and that if something went badly wrong, the whole ship had to return. It wasn't just a matter of calling up a helicopter and going home. Um, yes. I'm just seeing another that. question. Uh, just waiting for Stuart to rejoin us. I can see he's come back in, but and he's on as a broadcasting, and his video is on, but I can't see him. No. <laughs> Any comments or questions? No. Here. I'll see if there's anything in the conversation zone if he's typed into that. No. Right. Okay. And there's one just come in here, another one from Jared. Um, any thoughts on Australia's new icebreaker? And the yes, it was, and curiously, it was made in Romania, not in Australia. Um, it's a well-designed machine uh, and it should do the job. It's a shame that both we've, we've lost our manufacturing industries to the degree that we have to get somebody else to make it for us. It'll be a fine ship. It'll be great. Yeah, bring it on. Sooner the better. And the other thing Jared mentioned was the um, David Aerodrome. Do you know of that project? The um, to make an aerodrome, you basically need one of those um, traverse specials to smooth out about four or five kilometres of ice. Now the trouble is that the ice moves, so you need an extra long runway because the friction on ice of tyres is not very great. Right. And right. then secondly, the ice itself keeps on migrating and lifting up and down and shifting and doing left and right. So you've, it is an expensive manoeuvre to build um, an aerodrome, uh, an airstrip, but it's the only way to pr have good reliability for getting in there, bearing in mind you can't get in there in the winter, winter months. Right. Um, in, as an example of um, having enough money in the system, we have now ended up in a situation where the billionaires of the earth, uh, between them, uh, all 2,000 of them, have as much money as the seven and a half, uh, sorry, the three and a half billion poorest people on earth. And uh, there's enough money in the system, it's not just being spread fairly. So as an example, in Australia, our GDP is $1,500 billion, and we give nearly 10% of that $140 billion away as tax rebates to companies, mostly foreign-owned, who take that money away overseas, um, and it just vanishes out of our economy. There's enough money okay. in the system to do what we need to do. With regard right. to fossil fuel companies, out of every dollar on planet Earth that is earned, they get six and a half cents given to them by the governments of the world for free as a present. Why? Cool. When was the last time you saw one of those people having a lambkin <laughs> sale um, or a pavlova sale at your local primary high school? And I admit that pavlovas were invented in New Zealand. <laughs> 
And uh, I think it's Lucia says she's booked to travel in Feb travel there in February. Is that a good time of year? I'd say there's there's not a bad time to go to Antarctica, except oh. maybe in the winter. <laughs> sure, uh, exactly. Look, you'll have a good time seeing. Uh, it's just going to be amazing. You'll have a really good time. Um, just take a nice camera. If I could make a suggestion. I came up with a sort of – I used to take down a big kit that would weigh about 11 kilograms. Look around for something called a super zoom. So these are new cameras. They're uh, not quite a digital SLR, and they've got a 20-to-1 optical zoom. Not 3-to-1, not 5, 20-to-1 optical zoom. And they're remarkably capable. And the one that I took – um, will actually take um, movies before you press the button. Right. So what you do is you aim it where the penguins are jumping out of the water and you hit the special secret button and you, and you let it, it's just sort of photographing everything, filming everything and then throwing it away. And then when you suddenly see a penguin jump out, you press a button and instead of throwing away the last one and a half seconds, it keeps that one oh, okay. and a half second. And then it keeps another one and a half seconds and you've got three seconds of something which you wouldn't have got otherwise. So look for that feature or just contact me directly via Robin and I'll talk you through it. But that's a really good all-round camera to take with you. That's cool. Well, I found that the best, one of the best things I've took, which was um, by mistake I sort of got suggested it, and that was just a, a lanyard from a conference, um, Nick, um, name tag and it was really cool handy to have when you were doing the landings because i i clipped my room card to it and um also a small camera or your phone so you didn't have to worry about dropping them or losing them um and it was just a sort of handy thing to have um also get gloves where you can flip the fingers out as well you know like yeah. little mittens with those but you know <laughs> if the temperature's not that bad you'll have a you'll you'll have a ball it'll be great okay that's great thank you carl um i've I think we, we've been going for uh, quarter to eight now, so I really appreciate your time and um, really thank you for contributing to the to the presentation. Um, it's been really cool to see you again, and oh, um, no and I'd like to thank um, Stuart, um, the, the Antarctic um, Society, and and the Meetup for for letting us do this. Um, I hope someone got something of value out of it, and uh, I think. Uh, I've just got a little message here from Stuart. It looks like his audio is not working, um, and he just says thank you very much. The, thank uh, you, Dr. Stewart, and thank you, Dr. Robin. And um, I think uh, if, if that's it, we'll probably kill the live stream soon, but I think Stuart has to do that for us. <laughs> okay, I'll go and greet my family and have dinner at the ridiculously early hour of a quarter to six for me, which is just <laughs> fine. Got some serious TV watching to do tonight as well as writing. That's cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the honour of